this is a very good venue for us. We've been an active participant for many years in supporting it, and we find the presentations uh, to be uh, very relevant and good, as well as the networking opportunities. I think this is one of the, the great venues for having lots of professionals in the industry come together uh, once a year, almost like a ritual, and showing the greatest and latest from everybody and talking to each other and understanding what's going on. Conferences like this, I, I, I learn a lot. I don't travel that much. Um, I don't go to all that many meetings, but Global Mill Satcom is one of the ones that's definitely worth going to. We're talking today about the Global VSAT Forum, an industry organization that raises awareness of and lobbies for the commercial satellite telecommunications industry. Can you give me an idea of how many members comprise your organization? Our membership covers the uh, entire value and supply chain of the industry. And we have um, 200 plus members. They're globally based and cover, as I say, the whole of the value in the supply chain. So we're speaking of the satellite operators, uh, equipment vendors, value-added service providers, all the way through to um, uh, law firms with uh, notable telecoms practices, some end users, but essentially the entire value in the supply chain bringing in also, as I say, certain aspects of the end user community as well. <coughs> um, one of the initiatives your group is working on is a training program for satellite operators. Yes. With, uh, dish antennas to keep them within boundaries so that they don't interfere with somebody operating next door. This training program is funded in part by your members. Yes. Can you give me a, a, an update as to how that's going? Well, it's going extremely well and continues to grow. Our training programs first came into existence around about 10 years ago. And then around about seven years ago, their level of sophistication in terms of the resources employed to conduct the training and in terms of the mechanism by which those training resources are delivered became much, much more sophisticated when we, GVF, got together with a bunch of guys who themselves had a long period um, uh, as engineers in the satellite industry. They formed a company to actually deliver professional training solutions for the SATCOMS community. And we now have a large suite of training resources. They are delivered online. We have currently some 8,000 plus students um, having progressed through various levels of the training. We're conscious that we have uh, many, many more thousands to actually get to, but because we're online, because we're so accessible, and because we are not only recognized as the key training resource for the industry, not only because we are, as I say, so open and accessible 
and very flexibly and reasonably and accessibly priced, that um, it has continued to grow and grow and grow to the extent that, I mean, if for example right now I had one of my PowerPoint slides available, I think one of the greater illustrations is the number and range of uh, organisations that actually use our training. Not only a number of the world's most notable um, global and uh, regional satellite operators, uh, but key companies in various key um, vertical markets, like oil and gas, for which satellite is extremely important, of course. And a whole range of other organisations as well. There are various agencies of the UN that use us. And um, I might also add that the, um, the United States uh, FBI also uses us, as well as certain elements in the military. Ah, so you are working with militaries? In we, do, we do indeed, yes. Can you give me an idea? Of well, let me give you um, perhaps um, a little anecdote um, from a time I um, spent at a conference related to um, uh, telecommunications focus on, on Iraq. And this uh, conference continues now, but it uh, did exist back when the US was still administering post-conflict Iraq. And the guy that then headed up the, uh, the military communications systems and requirements um, for the US administration um, within Iraq um, was present at the conference when I gave my presentation about our training. And he took me to one side at, uh, a little later on and indicated to me that, um, well, if your training is as good as you say it is, and of course it is, he said, it's better than what we're doing in the US Navy and the US Marines. And um, certain contacts were made following that in order to facilitate an extended military client base for, um, for our training programs. Um, another initiative uh, to the same end that uh, would prevent people from pointing their dishes to identify, to identify the signal to figure out whether there's interference or not. This is the carrier ID initiative. Um, what's the status of that? Is it, is it being adopted more and more now? It is certainly in the, um, in the video sort of SCPC world. That's a, that's a given fact now. I mean, GVF, of course, has been uh, um, involved in um, carrier ID to the extent that it is something that is adjunct to and closely linked to training. Um, as well as our um, product quality assurance initiative linked into our equipment type approvals initiative. Basically it forms a, a suite of initiatives that challenge interference. And Carrier ID is one of those that GVF um, has been engaged with in partnership with other organisations. Training, I mentioned our partnership with SATPROF. Uh, carrier ID, I would mention our partnership with the Satellite Interference Reduction Group. Um, and then, as I mentioned, there are those um, specifically GVF initiatives like the training um, that come out of um, a long history of development within GVF to do with, for example, type approval of equipment to ensure that the equipment that is being used to point to a satellite is not in any way contributing to uh, interference issues affecting the orbital arc. And um, that extends also to the, uh, the performance-related work that we do in terms of ensuring that um, not only is equipment properly pointed, but the equipment is, is up to scratch to do the job in the first place. Because there are um, certain parts of the world that um, have increasingly got into two-way transmit, receive, antenna production. And um, those products aren't always quite up to scratch. And we see evidence of um, some of those products in certain markets around the world, markets for which satellite, I mean geographical markets for which satellite is very, very important, but also the price point is very, very important. And we need to really ensure that end users are using the kinds of equipment, as well as installing it properly, that um, make sure that um, we, we continue to challenge this interference issue. How serious of an issue is interference for you? Well, it's interesting. <coughs> Any one single instance of interference is a nuisance. It can be a costly nuisance. Um, but in terms of the broad scope and size of the satellite communications market around the world, interference of all types are quite a, a minor percentage of all the traffic that's going on. 
But as I say, a single instance is a problem. Of course, there are it's more than one instance, but there are surprisingly, surprisingly few when you look at the huge range of SATCOM's work that's going on around the world, of SATCOM's traffic that's flowing um, each and every day. Um, but the fact that it is statistically a small issue doesn't really impress a given end user if they are having the problem with getting their traffic right. delivered. Where we're an industry that prides itself on you know, bringing um, top-notch solutions to our end user customer base and ensuring that those top-notch solutions are always um, delivered to a, a very, very high standard. Um, the World Radio Communications Conference is coming up and I was wondering how serious is the concern that the broadband terrestrial wireless folks, having been partially defeated at the last conference, are coming back again and trying to raid spectrum for the satellite community? Is this, well, is protecting C-band going to be an issue? Protecting C-band is absolutely going to be a continuing issue. Of course, this particular situation um, first arose in the build-up to WRC 07. And it was at 07 that the satellite industry had something of a victory that I like to phrase as, we won the battle, but not the war. But when I use that phrase, I have to use have to heavily qualify it because when you consider that the satellite industry itself has a long history of working with other technologies, bringing solutions that are sometimes based on technological hybrids, and that for example if we look at the case of specifically of Africa, specifically of GSM or 2G, but certainly extending through more contemporaneously to 2.5G and onwards towards 3. The terrestrial guys don't readily acknowledge the fact that were it not for satellite, none of the backhaul could ever be achieved. It's an example where satellite has played its imperative part in the delivery of a solution that in the case of Africa has completely transformed the telecommunications environment and done a lot for the economies of various African nations. So, why am I saying this? Why am I qualifying this? We don't want any sort of conflict with the terrestrial broadband wireless access guys. We want to work with them to help them, to assist them, bring their solutions fully to bear to the marketplace. But we can only do that if our spectrum, in the case of C-band, long legacy satellite spectrum, it is, is preserved and, and, and protected. Um, but we also have to look towards WRC um, 2015 in terms of potential for incursions into other parts of traditional satellite spectrum as well. KU, KA, who knows? But we do know that the terrestrial guys have a very, very big purse mm -hmm. to help finance their going for what they would like to see, but I would add there are a number of administrations around the world whose regulators have, and this is harking back to you know, the historical and contemporary WiMAX period, I'm not speaking of things like 4G and LTE, where administrations have reversed their decisions in granting licenses in C-band to WiMAX providers because they've realized the effect that their decision had upon the, that country's dependence upon satellite using C-band. Right. I won't actually mention any uh, administration specifically, but there are several that have reversed their policy, reversed their decision, because they've realized, well, the WiMAX guys will have to go elsewhere because we need C for satellite, period. Yeah, that's interesting. Aside from C-band, uh, what other issues important to your members are going to be put on the table at the WRC? Well, obviously the spectrum issue is absolutely key. Um, in terms of what I mentioned about being able to work with our colleagues in the terrestrial side, it's a question of leveraging off of the discussions at WRC 15 so that we don't generate a situation where 
there is potential uh, conflict, because I'm working on the premise, of course, that the satellite side will actually come out victorious. Um, but it must not be, that must not be, just be the end point. It's got to be a lead in so that there is a, a, sort of a synergistic appraisal of where the 4G and LTE guys can go um, to, best, to, to best work with satellite. Um, that's my view of you know, what is overwhelmingly the, um, the key issue and the uh, follow-on adjunct issue.